Let's get ready for the word. Amen. Ready for what God has to say to us today? Amen. Amen. We, we're just excited. We're just excited. Um, Dr. Felix introduced me. And so the, the, this next, next slide here are some key texts, some key um, texts that I want you to study this week. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of them today, but I want you to study those, especially on Wednesday night when we come together to debrief, debrief the word and, and to ask more questions and have more of a dialogue. I want you to have studied those uh, texts there. So Numbers 13, 1 through 33, Numbers 14, 1 through 45, and then Hebrews uh, 12, uh, 1 through 2, uh, because those will definitely uh, give you more context and more substance of where we are going today. Amen. But our key verse today is Numbers 14 and 11. Uh, Numbers 14 and 11, which says this, The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? How long will these people not believe me, despite all of the signs that I have performed in their midst? And our big idea today is this. What will determine if we wander in the wilderness our walk in the God possibilities in our individual and our collective's lives is not belief in self or belief in us, but our belief in God. Amen. Let me say that again. What's going to determine if we wander or if we walk in the God possibilities is not our belief in self or our belief in us, but it is our belief in God. God. See, we live in a culture that thinks that we've got to believe in us, and we've got to believe in me, and, and it's all about me, and, it's, and that, is, that is counter to what God really wants. God wants his people to rest confidently in him, amen? Therefore, if we are to, if we are to live out the God possibilities for our lives and for this fellowship, we must reaffirm today. Everybody say today. We must reaffirm today that we believe God for kingdom success. Say kingdom success. For kingdom success and set our minds, hearts, feet, and hands to operate in alignment with this belief. Amen. We've got to believe God if we are going to experience kingdom success. Amen. Let's say that. Say we've got to believe God if we are going to experience kingdom success. So the question before us today is what if, what if we decided to believe God? What if in your life right now you decided to believe God? I'm not talking about play church, right? I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, putting a little bit of an hour and a half in your weekend schedule and, and, and then go back to doing your thing, amen? I, I'm talking about what if we decided in this moment, in this season, at this time, to really believe God? See, you, you read in the, in the key text, Numbers 14, 11, where, where Moses, where, where, where he, God was saying to Moses, God, what else do I have to do? What else do I have to do to convince these folks to believe me? Some of you have seen God do amazing things in your life. You are sitting here today by the grace of God because you know your dirt, amen. You know what you did, amen. You know you should be doing five to ten, amen. <laughs> you know. But God says, I have done great things in their life. You know that sickness should have taken you out. You know that stray bullet should have taken you out. You know that car accident should have taken you out. But, but, but God, amen. But God has you here and he says, what if in this moment you choose to really believe God? Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, what if we choose to believe God? So I, I want to give you some things that we need to believe God. Next slide that we need to believe God for. So first, what if we chose to believe God for his presence? A in between services, I was talking to Dr. Gilbert, and I, and I made this great, we, we made this great connection that, that all of these things that we're talking about today were not things that the people of God had to ask for. They were things that they already had. 
Yes, yeah, some of that will hit you later. Amen. These, these were not things that they had to beg God for. These were not things that they were, God, give it to us. God, give it. These were things that they already had, but because circumstances and situation had them all messed up, they forgot what they had available to them. So that's why today we have to choose, number one, we have to choose to believe God for his presence. Look at, look at the text in, 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 in Numbers 13. In, in Numbers 13, uh, verse, verse 25 through 29, he says, it, it, the text says this, And when they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told them and said, we went to the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, everybody say, watch out for nevertheless. Right, Here, here's these good things. They're going to tell you it's a, it's a good thing, it's a good thing, but nevertheless, look where they went. The people who live in that land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And the Amalek is living in the land of the Negev. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and the Canaanites are all living there. It's a great land. Lots of potential. Nevertheless. See, they had forgotten that they had the presence of God with them. So it was the nevertheless that deterred them. See, all of us are sitting here and we see the great move of God in this place. We've, we've heard the story of what God has done, but yet we find ourselves getting hung up in the nevertheless. Nevertheless, it's going to be hard. Nevertheless, it's going to require more time. Nevertheless, it's going to require more sacrifice. Nevertheless, I'm going to have to change up. Nevertheless, nevertheless, nevertheless. And we find ourselves not moving with the presence of God but being stuck in nevertheless. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, get unstuck. Get unstuck out of that. Look, be careful. Be careful. Look, even when I was, even when I was praying for God to, to move in our lives, to give us clarity around this, I had to keep people out of my circle who had a nevertheless spirit. Right? you you got to be careful for that. You know, as, as we want to see the move of God and, and we want to see God do great things in our life and you're waiting on God to speak to you and, and God has shown you a, 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 a harvest, God has shown you a healthy land, God has shown you all these things, be careful because y'all got some nevertheless friends. Amen. God is speaking a rich word to your life. God is speaking possibilities in your life. But you got a nevertheless friend that always seems to call you. Right after church, amen. Always seems to call you right after your worship time. Always seems to call you after your devotional time and spit some of that nevertheless game into your spirit. Some of y'all are stuck in the nevertheless because you got the wrong folks in your circle. See, they was talking right. They were talking right. Yeah, this is what the land looks like. This is what the land has. And here's the fruit of the land. And, and they should have just said, look, and it's ours. Right? They, they should have claimed it. They should have declared that this is ours because they had the presence of God. See, the enemy, the enemy wants you so discouraged by the presence of difficulties in your life that you forget who's with you. Okay, let me say it again. He wants you so discouraged by the difficulties in your life that you forget who's with you. That marriage problem, I know it's difficult. That addiction, I know it's difficult. Raising kids, I know Jesus. It's difficult, amen. But the presence of difficulty does not mean that I forget who's on my side, amen. Just because it gets hard. Just because I got to sweat a little bit. Just because I might have to cry at midnight doesn't mean I forget who's on my side. Somebody's a witness today, amen. I, I don't forget. I don't forget. I don't forget. I, I, I might get. Uh, I might get a little, little shaken by those things, but I cannot be discouraged and forget that I have His presence. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I have His presence. Next slide. So not only do we have His presence, Amen, but we have His 
protection. Amen. Now, now you, you, you go down to verse 30 there in that, in that same text, and then you get, you get Caleb. Okay? So I named him this right here. Not you. There's another kid, right? So I named Caleb, right? And you get Caleb who's hearing all these folks. Oh, my God. It's going to be hard. Oh, my God, Bernard, we can never do this. Oh, my God, Sister Ned. Oh, we can. Oh, Pastor Karen. Oh, my Lord. All of that. And then all of a sudden, Caleb says, hush, hush. But oh, it's hard. Oh, Felix then told us again. Oh, my goodness. Oh, hush. Folks complaining, folks murmuring. Oh, my goodness. Well, oh, my, do you see how big they are? Those grapes are bigger than my head. Oh, my, hush. Caleb steps into the situation and says, look. Do y'all not remember who's with us? Do you not remember who's protecting us? Look, all of that foolishness. Hush, amen. Some of y'all got some folks in your life right now that you need to look at them. Hush. Somebody said shut your mouth, amen. <laughs> but, but you need to look at them and, and say hush. Every time they want to speak contrary to the word of God in your life, you've got to turn to them and say hush. Every time they want to say that God's not going to come through, hush. Every time they want to say God's not going to heal, hush. Caleb knew what God could do. He knew that they had God's presence and they had God's protection because he knew that it was God who had brought them out from Egypt. He knew it was God that had brought them to the destination that they were at now. And Caleb said, hush. Some of us today have got so much noise in our heads. Yeah? So many voices. And they say the voices in your head are okay as long as you don't talk back to them. Amen? <laughs> right? We, we got so many voices in our heads. And God is saying right now, just tell them to hush. Just tell them to hush so that you might hear what God is saying in this moment. The one thing I love about worship is worship is my hush time. Amen. When, when, I, when I get a chance to, I know Excel Energy is due. I, I know CenturyLink is due. I know the car note is due. I know Geico is due. But I just need some hush time. Amen. Because when I get in my hush time and I come out of my hush time, I'm reminded that he's Jehovah Jireh. Amen. That he will provide all my needs. When I, when I get out of my hush time, I'm reminded that if I'm sick, he's Jehovah Rapha. When I get out of my hush time. Some of y'all got so much noise going on in your life. And if you just want to see God move, just say hush. Yeah, some of y'all, that was your cue. <laughs> say hush, amen. Amen. You, you know in your heart right now, in your mind, right now, you're just troubled, but you just need to say, hush. See, the enemy wants us to be demoralized and forget that we have divine protection that has brought us this far. Okay, when we were growing up, the old folks used to sing, we come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. Trusting in his holy word. He's never failed me yet. And oh, can't turn him. Some of y'all went to Baptist church, amen. Y'all remember the choir marching down. <laughs> We've come this far by faith. He says, no matter what, no matter how the enemy might want to demoralize me, I am reminded in this moment that I have God's protection, amen. Turn to your neighbor say, neighbor. God's got my back. God's got your back. God's got your back. God's got your back. God's got your back. Don't worry about it. God's got your back. God's got your back. You trying to fix that marriage? God's got your back. God knows your credit score. Amen. He's got your back. Amen. God knows how long you've been unemployed. God's got your back. God knows what the doctor said just last week. God's got your back. God knows how long those children have been acting crazy. God's got your back. God knows how long that grandson of yours has been coming in and out your house. God's got your back. And because I've got his presence 
and I've got his protection, uh, I stand up a little bit taller. Right? The enemy wants my head bowed down. The enemy wants me, wants me all discombobulated because of all of this stuff that's going all around me. But God wants me to rest in him. God wants, God wants me to, to be reminded that I have his promises, that, that I have his protection, that I have his presence. And thirdly, God wants us to know that we have his promises. Amen? Look, look what happened in, in, in Numbers 14, 1 through 10. You see the people here, they started again crying. Crying out, oh my goodness, why, why did you bring us out here to die, Felix? Why, Felix? Why did you bring us out here to this big old play? Oh, Felix, why? Take us back. Seven memorial stones ago. Take us back. Take us back to a small, oh, take us back. They started to complain, they started to cry, and then, look, this is what happens to us. They decided that they wanted to go back. Now, I don't know about you, but, but, but look at this. The enemy wants you so disillusioned that you disconnect from God's promises, and you would rather go back without him than move forward with him. Isn't that something? Amen. That, that it can get so bad in your life that you will say, look, look, God, I, I, I don't believe that you're going to do what you said you're going to do, so I'm just going to go back to that man that I know isn't good for me. I'm going to go back and live in that situation that, that I know is not healthy for me. But, but because, God, I, I just can't believe that you're going to work this out. Let me say something about God's promises. God is faithful. He who promised it will bring it to pass. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, if he promised it, he's going to fulfill it. Look, and, and look, I'll give you this illustration. I, I gave all of my kids, I, I believe it was around Christmas time, I gave all of my kids a, a dollar, right? You know, it's like when you forgot to go get a gift, you got to make one up really quick. <laughs> Some of y'all know, right? So I, I go and I give them all a dollar, and I said, okay, this dollar is a multiplier. And I can't tell you when, I can't tell you how, but I need you to hold on to that dollar because you know that it's got a promise to multiply, right? So I give the dollar to Caleb, and before I know it, Caleb's at 7-Eleven buying some hot Cheetos, amen. His dollar's gone, amen, right? Then, then they gave the dollar to Nathan, and, and Nathan gonna tell me in the, in the, in the vest of you today, he said, hey man, somebody stole my dollar. Well, hey, that's not my problem, man. Somebody stole your dollar. But Lily, Lily, my sixth grade daughter, Lily the other day had the nerve to remind me that she still had her dollar, and it hadn't multiplied. Every other day, hey, Dad, I still have my dollar, right? Right in the pot, holding on to it. I still got my dollar. Dad, I still got my dollar. Okay, Lily, I still have my dollar, Dad. She's walking. Uh-huh. She holding on to this promise because Dad said at any moment you don't know when. Some of y'all going to shout in a second, amen. You don't know when, but that dollar that you've been holding on to, that promise that you've been holding on to, God is going to bring it to pass. So Lily walking around. Everybody else broke. Lily's like, aha, I got my dollar, amen. Everybody else wondering how they going to make ends meet. Lily said, oh, I got my dollar. And then she heard dad got a new job at restoration. And Lily said, oh, God, I got my dollar. She knew that the promise was about to be fulfilled. Some of y'all need to walk in that. Some of y'all need to go to that job that's causing you problems just with your hand in your pocket. Yeah, I got a promise. Amen. God's, got, God's, got, God's about to do something. Amen. God's about to work this thing out. God's going to break through. God's about to restore. God's about to bring it back together. I've got a dollar. See, Caleb and Joshua were of a different spirit. They knew what God had promised. And while everyone else was crying, and even got to the point where they called for new leadership. They said, look, Moses done led us out here on this promise. We need somebody new. We need Felix and that new executive pastor it's just my first day, right? Amen. We, we, we need them to, but look, 
Joshua and Caleb said, no. They were holding on to the promises of God. Look, it, it even got to the point in verse 10 of chapter 14. The people wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb for holding on to the promise. Isn't that something? That God can get in our heads so much that we start being mad at the people who are still trusting God. Isn't that something? We turn on the people who trust in God because the enemy has got us so disconnected from the promises of God that we start to want to kill the very people who are holding on to God. Amen. All the leaders said amen. Amen. God expects all of us to hold on to his promises because he is faithful. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, God is faithful. God is faithful, and whatever God promises, God will perform. Amen. I know it seemed like it has taken forever. Come here, Abraham. Abraham said, I was 75 when he told me about the promise, and I was 100 when it was fulfilled. But I don't want you to mess up like Abraham. At the age of 86, Abraham, because the promise hadn't been fulfilled, he tried to help God out. Some of us need to stop trying to help God out. And just wait on God to fulfill the promise. Amen. We got to trust that the God who promised is faithful. It might take longer than you're used to. In a microwave generation where we can put a meal in the microwave and get it cooked in two to three minutes, we can't hold God to the same standards. Amen. Again, the old folks taught me well when I was growing up. They said he may not come. When you want him, amen. But he's always on time, amen. And not my time, amen. On his time, amen. Not the linear way of time because God himself is outside of time, amen. He can do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, where he wants to do it, with who he wants to do it. That's how God works. You might think it doesn't look like your season of fulfillment, but God's looking at it and saying, yep, wait till tomorrow. Wait till tomorrow. But you've got to hold to the fact that we have his promises. Next slide. He says, not only do we have his promises, but we have his power. Amen. The, remember, these folks were, were acting ugly. They had started to rebel, and, and they had started to doubt God. They had started to doubt what God was going to do. And, and so Moses had to intercede for the people. God was sitting here. God was, like, uh, frustrated. God was upset. He said, you know how much I've done for these folks? You know how from where I brought them? You know the ups and downs? You know all of this? And here these people are having the nerve to rebel against me and to rebel against my leadership. God was ready to wipe them out. And Moses said, God, don't wipe them out. Because if you wipe them out, those Egyptians who don't believe in you are going to say, well, they died in the wilderness because God couldn't do it. They died in the wilderness because God didn't have the power to deliver them. So Moses said, God, there are some things that we need you to do just because you have the power to do it. Not because we deserve it, not because we've been faithful, not because we've been the best children, but God, we need to do it simply because you have the power. And there are some things in our life and in our ministry that God will do just to remind us that he has the power. I don't deserve for God to deliver me. I don't deserve for God to do this. I don't deserve for God to do that. But God lifts me up. God has transformed my life. God has brought me from here and to, from there to here. And he's done it so that when folks look at us, they have to give glory to the power of God. See, God wants to do some things in your life simply because he has the power to do them. Not because you deserve it, but simply because he has the power to do it. So that when an unbelieving world looks on and they say, well, how did that get done? They don't want you to say, oh, Felix did it. Oh, Vernon did it. Oh, Karen did it. Or oh, oh, Katani did it. That's not what he wants us to stand back and say, look and see the power of God. 
See, God was going to bring them out, not because they deserved to be brought out, not because they, they deserved to, to be, not, 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 not because they deserved a second opportunity, not because they deserved grace, but God brought them out and gave them a new opportunity because he has the power. God can do things in your life simply because he has the power. And you can say, God, look, I know I don't deserve this, but God, I need you. And God will move. Okay? Lastly, they had his, they had his presence. They, 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 they had his protection. They had his promises. They had his power. And lastly, they had his pardon. All right? Very important that we understand that they had his pardon. Here, God had decided that he was going to wipe them out. Here, God was like, look, I didn't had enough. And, and Moses intercedes for the people. And then God extends to them this pardon. And see, look, the enemy wants us to be so dejected by the consequences of doing it our way that we miss God extending grace and giving us another opportunity to do it his way. See, there are some of you right now who feel like you done messed up and it's over. You done messed up and God's not going to give you another chance. But that's not how God works. Every, every day that we get up, take another breath. That's God extending grace to us. That's God's like, look, I, I know you were a stubborn, hard-headed child yesterday. But my mercies are new every morning and my compassions, they fail not. So he says, I know you didn't get it right yesterday, but here it is. I'm going to give you a new day. I'm going to give you a new opportunity. And while those who were with the children of Israel, those 20 and older, died in the wilderness, God extended grace to their children, those who were with Joshua and Caleb and those who were 20 years and younger. God extended grace to them and allowed them to move forward into the promised land because God is gracious. God is gracious. And the morning, this morning when you woke up, God was extending you grace. Guess what? Everybody in this room might not know your dirt, but he does. Right? Everybody in this room may not know your struggle, but he does. And guess what he does? He gives you a new opportunity every day. He gives you a new opportunity every day to get it right, to live the way that he wants you to live. See, he pardons us. I, I, I'm so glad. The Bible says that in that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. He paid a debt that he did not owe. I owed a debt that I could not pay, and he pardoned me when on a hill far away. He died and again shed his blood that I might have a right to the tree of life. He took on my debt, my sin, and sacrificed his life that I might have this day, that I might have life and have life more abundantly. He pardoned me that I might have life and have life more abundantly. And he's done the same thing for you. So the question before us again today is, what if, what if, next slide, what if we choose his presence today? This is, we already have it. What if we choose to walk in his presence every day? What if we choose that for 24 hours, seven days a week, we're going to walk in his presence? How does that look different in our lives? What if we choose right now to say, he is our protection? And when we go out there and, we, and we're trying to reach our world and we are dealing with adversaries and we're, we're dealing with conflicts and we're dealing with this and we're dealing with that, we trust that he's got our back. What if we choose his power? What if we stop being arrogant and say, you know what, God, I can't do this. I can't do this in my own strength. I can't do this in my own intellect. God, I need you. I, I don't even have enough ideas to, to, to get us to where you want us to go. God, we need your power. We need you to do this. What if we choose to live with his promises, to know that he promised is faithful and he will deliver? And then what if we all chose today to walk in his pardon? To understand that he has forgiven us, that he has given us new opportunities. And to seize this moment, not to waste it, but to seize this moment for our individual lives and for our collective lives as a ministry. So the question before us today is simply this. What if? What if we choose to believe God? What if you leave here today? And at your home where you know there's been turmoil, what if you choose to believe God for peace? 
What if you choose to believe God for restoration? What if you choose to believe God for repairing the breach that has been broken? What if today you choose to believe God? What if you choose to believe him today for salvation? What if you choose to believe that he loved you enough that he gave his only begotten son? That whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. What if you believe today that the sin debt that you could not satisfy has been satisfied by the blood of Jesus Christ? What if you believe that today? What if we believed it? How quickly would God use us to reach Aurora, to reach the Denver metro area? to reach Colorado, to reach our nation, and to reach our world if we believed it. It's not about belief in me. It's not about belief in us. But it's about belief in God. I was born October 2nd, 1977. We'll be 41 this year. When I was born, I only weighed two pounds. And back in 77, it was unheard of for a premature baby born at 28 weeks at Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center to be able to survive and to live life. For 28 days, I lived in an incubator. And for 28 days, my grandmother and my mother would come up and pray every day over me, saying, what if we believe God? to heal this baby boy? What if we believe God to, to, to cause his lungs to work the way they're supposed to work? What if we believe God that he's only going to stay there for 28 days when the doctors had already said that he was probably going to spend the first six months of his life in the incubator? What if we believe God? And every day my grandmother prayed. Every day my mother prayed. Every day my grandfather was praying. Every day my aunts were praying. They were coming up and turning Fitzsimmons into the holiest ground ever because they chose to believe God. And because they chose to believe God some 40 years ago, I stand here today before you as a witness to the fact that when we believe God, he can do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ever ask, think, or imagine according to the power that's at work within us. I am a witness to you today that if we believe God, God will not simply do great things with us. He will do God things with us. And so today I'm challenging you. What if we believe God? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, God, that you have challenged us in this second service, God, to just believe you. In this season, in this culture where we are so caught up with self and we are so caught up with, with, with us, turn our eyes back to you. Turn our hearts back to you. Turn our minds back to you. Turn our hands back to you, our feet back to you. And God, let us trust you to do great things in our life. We declare, God, that we already have your presence. We declare, God, today that we have your protection. We declare, God, today that we are walking in your promises. We declare today, God, that we are walking in your power. We declare, God, today that we have your pardon. So we, your people, we answer the question, what if we would believe God? God, things would happen. And so we believe that. We walk in that. In Jesus' name, amen.